Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ken Murray. Tonight, we have a very unusual show for you. In the next 60 minutes, you're going to see the greatest all-star cast ever assembled on any television show. Over 60 movie stars. But before we start, let me make this clear. These are not old movie clips. There's not one shot out of an old feature motion picture. These films are all brand new in the sense that they've never been shown before. Of course, when I started taking these pictures over 30 years ago, there were very few actors interested in amateur movies. But today, as you will see, I have much more competition. <laughs> You know, in Hollywood, there is often more doing in the hours away from the camera than during the working day in front of it. And though these after-hour doings are mostly frivolous, glimpses like this of stars without scripts, capsule accounts of film personalities, can often be more revealing about a community than a stack of tomes written on the subject. This film was taken by an amateur photographer. If you think that hat is funny, you should have seen the one I had on when I arrived in Hollywood in 1927. Before we get underway, I must tell you how I started this collection. I came out west in 1927. It was my first time away from home, and naturally I wanted to send back some mementos to the folks. But instead of sending snapshots and postcards, I bought one of these newfangled 16 millimeter home movie cameras. I also bought a projector, but I left the projector at home, and from time to time, I would send back film of the trip. When I arrived in Hollywood, naturally I wanted to get as many pictures of movie stars uh, that I could so that I'd be a big man back in Kingston, New York. And as I look back now, I'm kind of embarrassed what a nuisance I was trying to make movie stars pose for me. I, I, I used to stop people on the street if they even looked like a movie star. And you know, you'd be surprised how many people looked like Fatty Arbuckle in 1927. But anyway, here are the pictures I sent back home. Los Angeles, 1927. This daring shot was taken from the top of the Orpheum Theater where I was playing. That's 8th and Broadway down there. This was taken in front of the Orpheum Theater. Recognize those cars? You should. You see them every week in The Untouchables. I had to send home a picture of my billing on a theater marquee. Of course, I wasn't the headliner, but at least they spell my name right. If you think the traffic is bad on the freeway today, you should have tried to get across downtown Broadway in 1927. Portrait of an early American jaywalker. funny hats on the stage, too. Here I am at the backstage door, borrowing money from the manager. The headliner from the week before was down the alley heckling me, Jimmy Durante with Sid Gorman. The youngest member of our troupe was 15 years old. That's Ricky Nelson's mother, Harriet Hilliard. Here's a young fellow who hadn't made a movie yet. 
When this picture was taken, he was a master of ceremonies in a picture house. Dick Powell. Ralph Bellamy was just starting out on a long and brilliant career. Here's a guy you watched week after week on Dragnet. And if you want the facts, ma'am, it's Ben Alexander. This is the first movie star I ever saw in person, Lou Cody. He was a big star in silent pictures. I stopped him on the street and gave my camera to a woman passing by and asked her to take this picture. You can see she was no James Wong Howe. The day after I closed at the Orpheum, I went out and played golf. These pictures were taken by a friend of mine who was a newsreel cameraman. In the middle of the game, I suddenly remembered that I had made an appointment in Hollywood to go through a studio in one of those big tourist buses. in 1927. But I made it in time, and with the rest of the tourists, here we go through the Paramount Gate. There's Will Rogers. That's Charles Bickford. All the stars were nice to us autograph hounds. That's Carol Lombard. This is the first movie star who ever invited me into his home, Richard Arlen. And this is the first Hollywood swimming pool I ever saw. Dick was the hottest star at Paramount at this moment. He had just made Wings, which was to win an Academy Award. I had to get a picture in that pool to send back home, so Dick took over on camera. You can see I was no Weissmuller. Lou Ayers. This was taken a couple of years before he made All Quiet on the Western Front. At this time, he was making a picture with Greta Garbo called The Kiss. It was the last silent picture made at MGM. This was the week that Grauman's Chinese Theatre opened. As a matter of fact, this is the day it opened, in May 1927. The picture was King of Kings. The people started gathering early in the afternoon. By nightfall, it was a madhouse. That's the beautiful Dolores Costello. The crowd really went crazy when Gene Hollow walked in. Such pushing and shoving, they knocked over lamps. Gary Cooper took it in stride. And so did Gloria Swanson. And there's Janet Gaynor and Charles Farrell. This was the year she won the first Academy Award for her performance in Seventh Heaven. The next day, I went down to the Warner Brothers studio on Sunset Boulevard. It afterward became a bowling alley and I believe is now a television station. I was lucky to get inside, but it was very difficult to get any great shots on account of the lights and the quality of the film at that time. There's Monty Blue working with a young lady named Myrna Loy. And there's Tom Nix doing a scene with a very pretty young lady, Sally Blaine. She's Loretta Young's sister. John Barrymore and Dolores Costello. I didn't shoot this, it was taken by the cameraman and I got a copy later but you'll see that it was done as a gag, as it has a comedy finish. This is the way they worked in silent pictures. Off-screen mood music and the director talking to the actors as the scene is being shot. All right, John, kiss her. Okay, cut. Cut! Mr. Barrymore, it's time for lunch.
outside the studio, I got another shot of the very handsome Mr. Barrymore. Then I went up to the Chaplin Studios on Sunset and La Brea. Chaplin and Fairbanks had come backstage at the Orpheum Theater on opening night, and I asked them if it was possible to visit their studio. Chaplin told me to come out this particular morning that he was entertaining a British military dignitary, and there would be a lot of cameramen there, and I would be welcome to take some pictures. his brother Sidney back there. This guy Charlie sure took some funny falls. I tried to ride one of those things myself once, but I assure you it wasn't quite so humorous. Sidney could ride it. As a matter of fact, I'm sure Charlie could have if he'd wanted to. Sidney Chaplin was quite a comedian himself. Pickford. The first time I ever saw Mary Pickford. America's sweetheart. The biggest movie star the world has ever known. She had just received a present from some fan and very graciously consented to pose for a picture. Doug Fairbank Sr. I don't know how I ever kept the camera steady enough to take a picture of my boyhood idol. I asked him if he would do one of those leaps off a balcony, and he did. This was my first trip to Hollywood, and I said, man, this is it. Horace Greeley was right. Notice the Fairbanks influence. There's the train coming to take us back east. I stood on the rear platform of that train, watching the golden sun sink into the blue Pacific. I murmured those famous words, I shall return. Two years passed before I got back to the coast again, and in that short time there were a great many changes in Hollywood. For one thing, the talkies had come in. As a matter of fact, that's why I went back. I was signed for one of the first talkies on the RKO lot. Modes of transportation were starting to change in America, too. Where I had come back east by train, I now rushed back to the coast by air. Yes, I took my first plane ride in 1929 in a plane that looked something like this, in a tri-motor plane. This was the fastest thing in the air at that time, going almost 100 miles an hour. Edgar Bergen was on the same plane. Now, I don't know whether you folks who travel in jets today realize what it entailed across the country by air in 1929. For one thing, there was no night flying. We are, all the passengers met at Pennsylvania Station, and we took an overnight train to Columbus, Ohio. We got off the train, took a bus to the airport, boarded a plane, and flew to Waynoke, Oklahoma. Then we got off the plane, and we took an overnight train to Clovis, New Mexico. And then we continued by air from Clovis, New Mexico to Los Angeles. By rail, air, and bus, we crossed the continent in the record-breaking time of 48 hours. Here's the plane. I wasn't nervous. I was hysterical. Lindbergh had only flown the ocean two years before. There's Edgar Bergen trying to be nonchalant. me was that we kept flying over water. 
what happens if we have to land? And just about this time, the pilot announced that we were running into some kind of a tornado and would have to change our course and go way up north. But I did get a chance to get a rather unusual picture. Mount Rushmore before it was completed. Finally, we got over the lush fields of California and started to land at Burbank. When we got to the airport, it was just swarming with newsreel cameramen and photographers. I thought Edgar and I had really arrived. But it wasn't for us. It was for some pilot who was coming in to change planes. He was getting off of his and getting on ours. I got a shot of his plane coming in. There he is, Charles Lindbergh. When I arrived at the studio that first day, everything seemed so different. The lights seemed bigger, the cameras were enclosed, there were sound trucks on the street. I made up very early in the morning, although I didn't have to work until afternoon. I've got a shot of myself here all dressed up, coming out of my dressing room. Here I am. No, 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 that's another vaudeville actor who went into motion pictures, Cary Grant. There I am. The biggest thing on the lot at that moment was Rudy Valley making his first movie, The Vagabond Lover. There he is on the set with Sally Blaine. She was in a lot of pictures. Here's a shot I got of the whole cast rehearsing a scene. Watch as the camera pans over. This great lady was making her first talkie at this moment, Marie Dressler. She was a great comedian. There she is, rehearsing just before a take. This was the final fade out of the picture, and I left it in to show you what a great sense of humor this Sally Blaine has. Now keep in mind, she had just been kissed by the number one lover of the world. Watch her face. But Valley wasn't the only Rudy who made the flapper's heart flutter in the roaring 20s. Three years before, it was Rudolph Valentino. I didn't take this picture. It was taken the year before I arrived in Hollywood. Not too long after the Latin lover was gone, his throne was occupied by America's boyfriend, Buddy Rogers. And then Buddy in the 30s was to turn over his throne to a man who remained king until he died. This is one of the earliest known shots of Clark Gable. Of course, when you talk about the conquest of feminine hearts of that era, you can't leave out this guy, Marie Chevalier. Here he is on the set with baby Leroy. Chevalier is an old friend, and I have a lot of shots of him, a great many of them with his arm in a sling. There he is with Allison Skipworth and our old friend Dick Allen. I never did know exactly how he hurt his arm, so recently I wrote him a letter to find out. You know, I thought it might be something real intriguing, like maybe he was climbing a balcony and some fair damsel slammed a window on his arm. But it wasn't anything as intriguing as that. I have the letter here, it's from Sicily. And it says, Dear Ken, I will be very happy to be among the friends who will appear in your Hollywood intimate story. At the time of the black sling, I had a broken collarbone. It happened one night when returning to Hollywood after an important preview out of town. And my car met by another car made a somersault with a lucky result of being just slightly hurt. Yeah, lucky not only for him, but for a whole generation that might have been deprived of a great talent. A man who's certainly become a legend during his lifetime. Another reason I dropped him a line was I wanted permission to use a piece of film of his. His screen test. Marie Chevalier's screen test. And to my knowledge, it's the first time he ever sang Louise. We have it, and I'm going to run it. And for the benefit of those who don't know how they conduct this screen test, this is what is known as a clapboard. And a fella holds it up in front of the camera like this, and he says, test, Chevalier, take one. Every little brain seems to win her, Louise. But in the queen seems to win her. Louise, <laughs> it's little Rose. Tells me it knows I love. I love every little bit that I feel in my heart. 
seems to repeat what I said. And the star, each little sigh tells me that I adore you, Louis. Just to see and hear you, <laughs> it's joy I never knew. But to be so near you thrills me through and through. Anyone can see who I have wanted your kiss. It has to be, but the wonder is this. Can it be true? Someone like you could love me. made a great impact on Hollywood in the 30s. Sunday night on the ether waves could mean only one thing. Edgar Bergen and his two alter egos, Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd. And some of the most exciting moments of these Sunday night shows were when this gentleman tangled with Charlie McCarthy in radio's most famous feud, W.C. Fields. I took this picture outside of his dressing room at Universal Studio. It's one of my prized possessions. I got to know Bill very well over a period of years, and contrary to the general impression that feels with an irascible old codger, I found him to be a lovable, kindly gentleman. Thanks to radio, this fellow also came to Hollywood. Bing Crosby is a real old friend. In fact, he sang at my wedding. I've got a lot of pictures of Bing through the years. Here's one in front of his dressing room when he was making his first movie. Here he is on the set of an early talkie, directed by David Butler. Alan Jocelyn was in that picture, too. Also, El Brindell. Incidentally, I think that Bing, probably more than anyone else, helps to popularize golf in the movie colony. Here he is with that great golf pro, Jimmy Thompson. That's Viola Dana, a big star in the silence. Watch Bing take his right hand off the club and put it back on before he hits the ball. John Barrymore was also practicing that day. And here's another young lady who enjoyed a swing around the links, Jean Hollow. Those bell-bottom slacks certainly tab the era, don't they? I took up golf myself in the late 30s. This was my first celebrity tournament. And man, I was really nervous. Of course, those hecklers didn't help. You'll notice that I have a swing that's neat, but not gaudy. I had a big gallery with me that day. Maybe my partner had something to do with it, old ski nose. That hope is the luckiest man on a golf course. Where do you see this putty mix? Look, it doesn't go in the front way. It doesn't go in the side. It comes around the back and goes in. And he's so snide about it. Of course, in the early 30s, polo was a very popular game. I used to live right above the Riviera Polo Field, and every Sunday I got a chance to take some exciting pictures. Will Rogers was responsible for spearheading the popularity of this game, and he attracted some of the biggest personalities of the movie colony as teammates. On this particular day, Leslie Howard was playing. That's Carol Lombard with Russ Colombo. Will Rogers, of course, was the big attraction. Here he is making a goal. I used to practice a little stick and ball myself. Never great, but I got so that at least I could hit the ball. Of course, it's much easier if there's no opposing team trying to stop you. But I never got to play like these fellas. From right to left, that's Johnny Mac Brown, Spence Tracy, Will Rogers, Leslie Howard, and James Gleason receiving the winning trophies from Carol Lombard. Tennis has always been popular in Hollywood. Here's Bob Cummings. You know, he's quite a health addict. I read his bestseller titled, How to Stay Young and Vital, but I must have skipped some of the pages. I don't look like that. 
This was taken at the Racquet Club in Palm Springs. I don't think there is any place in the entire world where the stars relax as much as they do at this desert spa. Here's a little horseplay between Edgar Bergen and Spence Tracy. Nice guy. Another very popular sport in the 30s was badminton. This was taken to Dick Powell's home. I took a crack at this game, too. In fact, I took a crack at everything. I think I read someplace once that you weren't really in the Hollywood swim until you've been pushed into your own swimming pool with your clothes on. So here's my next door neighbor, Mary Astor, obliging. I promise you, this was not rehearsed. Actually, some of the best film I have was taken on vacation trips. One summer, Glenn Ford flew a party of friends up to Sealy Lake, Montana. This is the most beautiful spot I've ever seen. Here's a couple of Isaac Waltons who made a bet on who's going to land the first lunker. That's Sonny Tufts. You know, this is home movies at its best. I'm sure that everyone who takes pictures has a shot like this. Scenes like this seem to capture a delightful, carefree quality that is almost impossible to get in the studio. This was taken at a nearby Indian reservation. Incidentally, this next shot was photographed by Glenn. That's, uh, that's Charlie Ruggles doing the Cheyenne cha-cha with a squaw. Sonny Tufts says it's time to go, but Glenn wants to shoot the Indians just once more. Van Heflin was up there making a picture. Here he is rehearsing a scene. His wife, Frances, was there watching her husband emote. Ward Bond was also in the picture. And of all things, Boris Karloff was playing an Indian. Susan Hayward was a feminine star, and boy, did she have it rough. This is not a heated swimming pool in the studio. This is the real thing. But we all got a lot of good pictures, Charlie Ruggles, Glenn, in fact, even the Indians got good pictures. Later that summer, I took a trip to Catalina on John Hall's boat. You know, John is an expert swimmer. was aboard. He's a lot of fun and a good sailor. When we arrived at Catalina, the first one we ran into was Lou Costello with his new boat, an 80-foot cruiser. Lou certainly enjoyed that boat. Imagine trying to explain to a fish who's on first. Errol Flynn was over on the island. You know what he's pointing at? His new boat, the Zaka, coming in to pick him up. On the way home, man, did that channel get rough. I have a shot here, it's a trick shot, but it shows exactly how my stomach felt. I was the first of the sick comedians. Probably the reason I have such a warm spot for my hometown is that in the 40s, Hollywood afforded me the opportunity of establishing some sort of record in my chosen profession, the stage. 
From 42 to 49, I had a show called Blackouts, which was literally the playground of the stars. Yeah, we played to everybody, from the old master D.W. Griffith to the elusive Greta Garbo, who sneaked in one night after the show started and sat in the balcony. I met a lot of friends during that time, and I got a lot of good pictures. Our leading lady was the luscious pinup girl, Marie Wilson. million people who saw the show, one of the most popular acts seemed to be this movie dog, Daisy, canine star of the Blondie series and her five puppies. Here's part of the act, exactly as it was done on the stage of Blackouts for over seven years. The idea was to try to make all the puppies sit up at the same time. And as Frank Sinatra would say, this was a guess. the way it's supposed to look when it's finished. changed a lot of lives in Hollywood. This was taken at Camp Pendleton near San Diego four days after it opened. That drill master is Private Jerome Power. These are authentic pictures. They are not clips out of an old movie. in the barracks, shining his shoes like any other good Marine, was another Hollywood refugee, Glenn Ford. Here's another interesting picture. This was taken at the naval base in Alameda. That's Ensign Bob Stack, who, of all things, was an aerial machine gun instructor. Machine guns, huh? <laughs> Looks like Elliot Ness was getting in some good practice. Hollywood Canteen, Christmas 1943. Betty Davis was there, Eddie Cantor was Santa Claus. When movie stars get together for a charity baseball game, you can always be sure of a great turnout. But I've never seen such a crowd as showed up for this one at Wrigley Field. Way before the game started, all the seats were filled and hundreds of fans had to stand on the field. They saw a great show, a lot of stars. There are the two captains, Frank Sinatra and Andy Russell. At this moment, they're announcing that all attendance records have been broken. Here's the bat girl, Jane Russell. You know, I think Major League Baseball could use an innovation like this. There's the umpire coming out of the dugout. I'll bet Leo DeRocha wouldn't argue with this guy. Yeah, even the Three Stooges were there. They were trying to watch Burt Lancaster at bat. Burt hits a good one and legs it out to first base. I didn't get a chance to shoot many plays, but this next one is a pip. Mickey Rooney was at bat. Mickey hits the button and runs to first base. The first baseman misses the ball and Mickey runs to second. The second baseman muffed the ball and Mickey ran for third. Three bases on a bunt. He starts for home, changes his mind, goes back and they call him out. Well, that, that, that's the umpire, Jack Carson. I thought they were gonna kill him.
shortly after the war, I participated in another baseball game, but it wasn't at Wrigley Field. It was on a sand lot in Beverly Hills. It was a father and son game. Bing Crosby pitted against his boys. I was the umpire. You know, I was around when Bing started this club. I walked the floor with him the night that boy, Gary, was born. That's really collecting cigars the hard way. And there's Philip coming in. Phil hit a good one that time, a three-bagger. You know, only in Hollywood could this happen. Probably the greatest entertainer of our time, playing baseball with his sons on a sandlot in back of a church and going unnoticed. That's Lindsay. Here's another fellow who takes time out to play with his kids, Bob Cummings. Bob has the most unusual method of teaching his youngsters to swim. Almost before they can walk, he puts them on his back, makes them hold on, and swims underwater with them. Look, Ma, no snorkel. She must have liked it. She couldn't wait to get back in the pool. Here's another interesting shot, taken from the bottom of Bob Cummings' pool. Watch this little girl's face as she holds her breath. The title of this next picture is, Are You Sure Marilyn Monroe Started This Way? So far, you've seen almost three decades of film that I've taken since I decided to make Hollywood my hometown. As you probably noticed, I, I didn't take every shot, and I might have mixed up some of the dates and places, but, uh, you know, it's very hard to remember everything that happened in 35 years. But I'm giving you the same treatment I gave my folks. After all, I was never one to spoil a good story by the lack of a few facts. I still like to take pictures. Matter of fact, I've been at it so long, I can't kick the habit. Just, uh, just recently, a couple of photogenic friends of mine left for Rome. It was very early in the morning, but uh, I was there. I drove back from the airport that morning, I was inclined to disagree with those who contend that Hollywood has lost all its glamour. To me, even after living here for years, the people of movie town are still some of the most glamorous personalities on the world stage. Yeah, whenever I see a tourist with a camera, I have an inkling of what motivates him. This is where I made the first mistake, letting another comedian take my picture. I didn't want the camera back with that picture in it. I'd rather have the bicycle. Uh-oh. For a moment, I thought I was going to take one of those Chapman Falls. Remember this gate? We really should have a title here saying, 30 years later. Well, the studio looks just the same. <laughs> That's more than I can say for that actor. I went over there to see Frank Capra, who was making a new movie. I caught him just as he was coming off the set. I figured we ought to get some pictures and we might as well let him take them. Anybody can do a better job than that hope. The first to come out was my old fishing pal, Glenn Ford. He was surprised to see that I had put Capra to work. 
It was nice to see Glenn again, but I didn't want to detain him too long. Even movie stars only have an hour for lunch. Then out came probably the greatest dramatic actress of our time, the one and only Betty Davis, with Hope Lang, another star of the picture. Betty was surprised to see me there. If she seems heavily made up, it's because she's playing Apple Annie in this Frank Capra picture, Pocket Full of Miracles. Incidentally, Hope Lang had just finished doing a crying scene, so Capra kept up a steady stream of funny gags, trying to make her laugh. I tried to hook it up with the apples, but you can't top that Capra. I had my two little daughters with me that day. It was their first time inside of a studio, and before we left, I took the kids for a walk down Paramount's Western Street. I tried to explain to him that one of the first talkies I ever remember seeing was the Virginian. It was a class western, the first of a long row which Gary Cooper was to make during his lifetime. It was made on this street. You know, each time one of these giants of the screen leave us forever, Cooper, Gable, Bogart, the sense of loss is a great deal more pronounced. For men like Coop were childhood heroes, and their image was never shaken on through adulthood. I sometimes wonder if our children growing up will have such heroes from the screen, men that they will recall for a lifetime with affection and pleasurability. I hope so. Good night.